She had been going there for seven years, never once was allowed to see the pastor except for him being on stage. It's not just me, it was my mom got online and looked. She liked what she saw about your church, she's on the East Coast, but she knows what's probably happening at home. And I said, call your mom right now, mm. put her on speakerphone. Mm. It's like it was impossible to have a good marriage and a healthy family and be a pastor. You deserve to have those answers, buddy, because that's what got rocked for me and you deserve to know who I am. And if I'm not willing to let you do that, I should not be on a stage talking to you. You tear me up, man, I'm sitting here. Uh... A lot of people are skeptical of mega church pastors and I being one of them. And some people would even say that my content has added to some of the division we see in the church today. Well, being a Christian and having an online presence, I'll often get people reach out to me from some of the biggest celebrity mega churches out there. And they'll share intimate details with me that are off the record. The lack of accountability, the isolation, the green room pastors, and also having met some of these guys over the years personally. I would be disingenuous to say some of these things haven't swayed my perspective and created a bias oftentimes against megachurch pastors. But as my platform grows, I have tend to have more access to more people I normally wouldn't get to have conversations with. Which leads us to today's video. I sat down with a megachurch pastor that many of you guys may know. We had 56 services a week and options that you can go to mm. with all our campuses and venues. But this consumer Christianity, I've never understood that. It's yeah. like, yeah, people need to buy into what they yeah. want. And, and I will be honest, many of the things he said in this interview completely changed my mind. You can have a relationship with God and have nothing to ever do with church. And I didn't pull any punches. I asked him all the hard questions I wanted to ask. I don't want to be a mega church. You guys are a mega church. We are. The, the, the critique is obviously like, well, a church that big, how can people be connected? Too multi-site, too many screens. Bruce Lawn. All right, ladies and gentlemen, this is a conversation I've been looking forward to having for a very long time. I am here with uh, arguably one of the best communicators I've heard live in person, like in the same room. And also, uh, he pastors one of the biggest churches, I believe the biggest church in my area. Um, I've heard him speak quite a few times, and uh, and every time he speaks, he crushes it. But we're going to get into the minutia of mega church versus small church, his story, how North Coast Church blew up. Without any further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Pastor Chris Brown. Holy cow, that intro, like, I wanted to hear this. I'm like, who are you talking to today? Let me tell you something. You have a you have no a way. voice for podcasting. Now, there you go. Man, you oh, go. man, that voice. Yeah, and a face that shouldn't be on video, I'll tell you that. Man. So... Uh, I first heard of you years ago, decade ago, at the time you and Pastor Larry were co-pastoring yeah. North Coast, and you came and spoke at the movement, my home church, at, oh, a, yeah. at a conference we had. I don't remember even what the conference was, and you gave this talk, this beautiful talk about co-leadership and uh, co-pastoring and, and how it was it – was, it was, I had never heard anything like it before. Yeah. And since then, you've now uh, – you are now the lead pastor, at the official title, lead pastor of North Coast Church – and uh, if you could just kind of tell us some of the origin story, how did how did how did you land here, pastoring one of the biggest churches? Oh in, my in gosh, I am the least likely dude to be in a church, okay. let alone working at a church. Okay, and to be sitting with you because this is an honor. Again, I've heard your stuff. So many of you guys from our church and people listen to your stuff, and so from time to time, I don't I know get, if I should be scared. When yeah, you no, say that or not. I, lo I love it. I get people going, "Hey, what's your take on this?" Or, "Hey, hear what they did on this." And I got enough of those to go, "Who is this guy?" All and right. then I didn't even know you were local at yeah, first. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, my thing is. I'm kind of that guy that started in church, uh -huh. growing up being forced to go to church mm -hmm. and never liked church at all. Mm -hmm. And then as you got old enough, you finally get to a point of realizing this doesn't work. Mm -hmm. It just, it church don't work. Mm -hmm. Religion doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And that was my story. And my most vivid moment of any church experience growing up, I was in about uh, third grade, the pastor's up speaking at this little Texas church that I was going to, pounding on the pulpit, you know, always telling us about hell and how bad we are and, and, um, uh, then the door opened behind the choir loft, and some men from the church came out locking arms. They had a woman in the circle that they were guarding, and a guy wrestled the mic from the pastor and let the entire church know in the middle of his message that he had been sleeping with this woman in his office, and they uncovered this affair. Meanwhile, the pastor's entire family is sitting in the front row. My oh, best friend yeah. is the pastor's son, and that's when, that's when I first vividly realized even the people running this stuff yeah. can't hold it together. Wow. And that's mentally when I just kind of checked out from church. I'm hmm. just going, I can be forced to go, but it's just, it's not going to be a part of my life. Wow. So that's why that irony of what I'm doing today and even sitting <laughs> here, it's, to me, it's it's one of the most laughable comedies of God. So, so you're from Texas originally? 
Yeah, I claim Texas is home. Most of my elementary years were East Texas. My okay. high school years were all out in West Texas. Okay. The two armpits of Texas. Uh -huh. Texas got some beautiful place in that yeah. nation. I came from the least beautiful of both, <laughs> right on the Louisiana border and okay. then far, far desert outside of okay. El Paso. And, how, and did, uh, how did you end up here in California? You know, my brother got out here okay. and uh, fell in love with a little blonde-haired, blue-eyed Southern California girl. Uh -huh. They got married. Her dad owned a little grove service and started employing my brother. Uh -huh. And then my brother gave me a call and said, you got to come check out Southern California. Yeah. He the knew promised I'd, land. Yo, I had graduated <laughs> from high school. I was basically just doing my own thing, yeah. running around. Um, and so I came out to hang out with him for a while, and I never left. And wow. then ironically, out here is where God started to get a hold of my life. When I finally could now have the freedom to do whatever I wanted to do, yeah. and once I truly lived the life I wanted to live, I couldn't stand being alone. Because mm. when I was alone, I hated who I was with. Wow. So all the freedom I had finally in the world led to, for me, the worst bondage. Mm. And so I was always hanging out with the crowd. I always had someone in my arm. I needed to have people with me. Because the moment I was alone, I didn't like who I was with. And <clears throat> that led me into a spiral that, ironically, that older brother mm -hmm. who grew up in my same type of format had found God outside of sort of religion mm. and really started walking with him. And he came and he just said, hey, there's two things you need to know. Number one is, you know that God loves you. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, God loves the world. And by default, I'm in the world, mm -hmm. so God loves me. Mm. But then my brother said this. Here's what you don't understand. God really, really likes you. Mm. And, and Ruslan, I'm telling you. God liking me was far more profound than God loving me. Because hmm. I'm like, oh, yeah, God loves me. But he doesn't like me. Hmm. And my brother's like, God really likes you. Hmm. And then the second thing he said, which may not have been true, um, but he said, you can have a relationship with this God and have nothing to ever do at church. Because wow. he knew I just hated church. Yeah. Um, in that, I was also abused by a Christian school principal mm -hmm. um, when I was a little kid. So I just had, I had enough of everything. Mm -hmm. From a pastor having affairs to the principal of this Christian school abusing me in his office to just going, that's it. Mm -hmm. That's all I needed to know and feel mm -hmm. about God and church. Mm -hmm. um, but now in my young 20s, I couldn't find, I had good success, great job. I was a sales coordinator for an engineering company out here. Mm -hmm. And yet that's kind of what brought me back. And in that journey then, God started bringing me back to people that really knew who Jesus was, not a religion mm -hmm. um, per se, and a whole new walk started to happen based on can a God really like someone who's done everything that I've done? Hmm. And so you're in your early 20s at this point. Yeah. Interesting. And then how long until you kind of discover that you have this ability to communicate God's word and to, to share and that kind of thing? Yeah, it's funny. The communication stuff didn't come that easily or naturally at first, hmm. but the relationship did. Okay. We had a youth pastor in town that knew my brother, and he asked me, he goes, hey, we're taking kids up to a winter camp. Mm -hmm. I can't get adults to go. Mm -hmm. You're only a couple years older than some of these high schoolers. <laughs> Would you go with us? Mm -hmm. Now, he had the mistake of thinking I'm a lot like my older brother, mm -hmm. which I wish someone would have told him, hey, this guy is not like his older <laughs> brother. You don't want this guy to be hanging out with your high schoolers. Because I'm like, whoa, I can I can hang out with yeah. you know senior girls yeah. Yeah. for a weekend. Yeah. And that's why I said yes. And yet in that, uh -huh. um, this youth pastor saw something in me and said, man, our kids love hanging out mm -hmm. with you. Mm -hmm. um, would you consider doing this? Mm -hmm. And I didn't have the heart to tell him, I'm not your guy. Mm. Like, I'm really trying to process if I even like God right now mm. and what that looks like. You don't need me leading in a youth group. Mm -hmm. But this guy took me under his wing mm -hmm. and for the next year or so just started to develop, hey, you can keep your construction job, um, but just start hanging out midweek and weekends with us. Mm. And then he got to know me and realized there's a lot of work that needs to be done in my <laughs> life. But he kept at it. So it sounds like the the discipleship part happened for you through you being willing to step out and serve in, in yeah. a local church. Yeah, ironically, I'm offered a position <laughs> to work at a church yeah. when I'm still trying to figure out if I should even be going to a church wow. and what type of church, because church was just a bad name. Yeah. And church had earned that with me. Yeah. And so you start in youth ministry yeah. initially. And what church was this at? Was this around this is here? This at Fallbrook First Baptist. Fallbrook. Okay, yeah. respect. Yeah, in Fallbrook. And so Jim Trail was the name of the guy that just saw something in me when no one else did. Uh -huh. Everyone else wanted to run from me. Yeah. Um, and that was fine with me because, again, I didn't like church. I didn't like church people. Um, they couldn't be trusted. Mm. And even those that came across like, you have it together, I immediately knew you don't. Mm. I know what you must be doing in your office. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, and yet in that, God started to get a hold of my heart and life that next year mm -hmm. of just... I fell in love of helping high schoolers mm -hmm. that were in the same boat I was in. You mm -hmm. didn't like who you were when you were alone. Mm -hmm. You had this facade of back then I was athlete, I was funny guy, mm -hmm. I was popular guy. And uh, it was you were just hiding behind that. Mm -hmm. And I saw all these dudes 
um, that had nowhere to go that would hang out at my house with me. And um, I had some guys I was renting a house with for a while. We'd mm-hmm. start doing Bible studies. And next thing I you know, there's 30, 40, 50 kids showing up on mm. Wednesday night just filling our living room, mm. just needing a place to hang out more than anything. Wow. And I'm I'm trying to read before they show up after work. Like, what's this passage about? What yeah, can yeah. I say about it? Yeah. You know, I'd be the guy that read a passage. What do you guys think about it? And yeah. then while everyone's talking, try to find something to say. <laughs> I was bluffing it. And then I'm making out with one of the girls once everyone leaves, uh-huh. you know, from the group. I mean, I'm still that guy playing that dual role. Mm. And that's where God started to just become more than just a name. Mm. Like something real started happening in my heart, in my mind mm. to go, this is real and I can't get enough of it. And what I really thought I want, mm-hmm. I've had enough of. Mm. And that was the transition. So And so so you go, so, so how long was that transition then? About three years, actually. Wow. So um, you go from no God, church is nuts i don't like these people yeah. to okay i'm okay with jesus i'm kind of going to church to serving I'm with okay you. with jesus i'm not sure about god yeah <laughs> I'm definitely out on church and yet this guy keeps having me come and work with these high work schoolers these kids. i was in it for the wrong reason and yeah. in that i was with all these teenage dudes that didn't have dads yeah. that just needed someone in their life to believe in them yeah. so i would find out like prom night nine guys would show up at my house on prom night and just bring all their stuff to get ready like mm-hmm. how do i wear this tux or how do i tie a tie mm-hmm. and where am I taking my date? And mm. we'd work out maps for all of them. Here's where wow. you're taking your date. Here's what you're doing. And yeah. I became this big brother role, and I saw the impact in yeah. these guys. Yeah. I was having more of an impact in the life of these high school guys than any impact that was going on in my life. Huh. And I saw that going. And, and yet, I'll be honest, part of that was like, oh, crap. Oh, crap. Am I supposed to do this? I can't be a youth pastor. I'm yeah. not going to work at a church. Yeah. Like, oh, no. No, no, like, don't fall for this. <laughs> don't fall for this. And yet, man, that pull, you know, that tractor beam just kept sucking me in yeah, to go, yeah. the only thing I want to do is hang out with high yeah. school guys and yeah. get them on the right track. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. We, we think of the passage where it talks about uh, delight in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart. Yeah. But oftentimes we forget the delight in the Lord part. Right? Yeah. You, you have to first uh, seek the kingdom and then all these things will be added onto you. And so it sounds like your heart started changing. God started doing something 100%. on your heart and your desires changed. And now you, you start developing this burden for people. Which is funny because when you delight yourself in the Lord, you realize there's a God that loves you, but he, in spite of who you are and what you've done, mm-hmm. he really, really likes you. Mm-hmm. Again, that blew me away. Like, oh yeah, God loved the world. I'm in the world. God loves me. Yeah. No, he really likes you. And I'm like, well, if he likes me, he doesn't know what I've been doing these last four years. Yeah. It's like, Chris, he does. Yeah. And he really likes you. Yeah. And that delight, knowing what grace and mercy really was. Mm-hmm. I knew him as words in church, but I never felt him. Mm. And knowing what grace was mm-hmm. started that delight. And that was then the desires of my heart started to change. Mm-hmm. And the eye of the rearview mirror that showed me, Chris, you followed what you thought was the desires of your heart. Mm. And, buddy, that that led you to a wrong destination every time. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, that, that for me is when things started to happen. And I tell you, the biggest thing after that then was— our American churches do a great job talking about forgiveness. You know, oh, forgiveness, forgiveness. We do a lousy job talking about freedom. Mm. Like I knew, and then I came to a point of knowing what I did, I was forgiven, mm-hmm. but I had so much guilt and shame about who I was, mm. what I've done, who I've done, mm-hmm. where I've been. Mm-hmm. And so even though I was forgiven, I walked with nothing but guilt and mm. shame. And your past, your past is true. So you can't outrun it. Yep. You can't hide it. It's yep. true. Yep. And it will become God's most incredible testimony and tool for you, Mm -hmm. or it will become Satan's most powerful tool against you. And that is depending on whether or not you find freedom from it. So I'm asking for forgiveness for things a hundred times. God, forgive me for that night. God, forgive me for that gal. Forgive me for that woman. God, forgive me for... And it's like, how many times do you have to ask forgiveness? Were you the guy in church every Sunday Mm. saying saying the sinner's prayer over and over? I was that guy for like two years. Every time. (laughs) Lord, forgive me. I accept Jesus into my heart. This is like the hundredth time. And they're like, well, are you asking forgiveness for this week? (laughs) No, no, about two and a half years ago. Yeah. For the first time, I go, no, I've asked forgiveness about 300 times. Well, either the cross (laughs) is broken or your understanding of forgiveness is broken. Yeah. Because the cross, like I'm taking my card, I'm swiping my card every week on the cross Mm -hmm. for the same debt. Mm -hmm. And I had forgiveness. No one walked me through freedom. Mm -hmm. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess, God is faithful and just, and he will forgive and cleanse us from that unrighteousness. I had forgiveness. Nothing cleansed me from all that unrighteousness. Mm -hmm. So every time I start to worship, man, Mm -hmm. you know, raise those hands, this little voice goes, really? Those hands? Remember Mm -hmm. what you used to do with those? Oh, I'd put them down. Hmm. Every time I'm like, Lord, I'm going to, this little, really? Hmm. You? What if people in this church find out who you are? Hmm. No no joke. So 
in that course, I become a youth pastor. I become the very thing I hate and I don't want to become. Mm-hmm. Um, and then my next youth pastor job up in uh, up in East LA County, Pomona area, I have three cardboard boxes that I keep flat mm-hmm. inside a cupboard in my office because mm-hmm. I know there's going to be a day someone from Fabric finds out I'm a youth pastor up in LA mm-hmm. and they drive up and they tell the church who I really am. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to unfold those boxes, get everything I can out of my office and just take off. Mm-hmm. And I'm waiting for that day that the rug's pulled out. When people wow. find out who I really am, what I've done. Wow. I had forgiveness. I didn't have freedom. Yeah. And I'm still with this, oh, man, if these kids really knew about mm-hmm. their youth pastor, mm-hmm. people still really know about Chris from 88 to 91 or mm-hmm. 92, mm-hmm. some of 93 and yeah, probably 2011, a little 2017. It's, it's just <laughs> sin nature. Yeah. And I didn't have freedom. Mm. So how did you find freedom? Because I think um, a lot of people relate to this. I think a lot of people relate to, I mean, I, I get so many DMs, whether it's about specific sins I get some DMs about people, you know, do I need deliverance for this thing? Do I have a demon? Yeah. I get so many of these types of DMs. And yeah. so, um, because because the freedom, you're, which you're kind of getting at, is kind of like the sanctification part. Yep. Uh, Jerry Bridges put out a book called The Disciplines of Grace, and he broke it down. He said, justification is all God. Glorification is all God. The sanctification is us cooperating mm. with God. So mm. it's saved That's by sal- grace, uh, salvation by grace through faith alone. Yeah, you've been given it. Yeah. Now you need to receive it. Now you got to cooperate yep. with the Lord to be refined to be yeah. the type of person he wants you to chisel away underneath that 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 slab of yeah you know what i mean just yep. nothingness and oh, then as good. it chisels away you have to cooperate with the holy spirit and yeah. so how do you how do you how does that happen for you how do you start cooperating I, and, and, and another and way sanctified? we're saying like the theology says i'm forgiven i'm sanctified i'm set apart i'm yeah. holy i'm considered a saint yep. not a sinner yep. i hate it when christians say i'm just a sinner saved by grace and mm-hmm. i'm like you don't know who you are yet then. that's right you're not a sinner you're yeah. a saint you're a child come on the theology was there. The head knowledge was there. Okay. How do you partner with that? I never applied it. Mm. I never applied it. Yeah. There's a big, big gap between knowing and doing. Yeah, or yeah. knowing and walking. And knowing and walking, yeah. And so you start looking at the woman at the well where Jesus meets this woman. Mm-hmm. And long story short, we all know what type of woman she is. I don't think, you know, she's considered the town, you know, whore or whatever and that. And that's painted the wrong picture. Women mm. didn't have that type of... Um, choice. Mm -hmm. She's a woman that's been used and abused over and over and over, and she's been discarded by husband after husband after husband after husband. Mm -hmm. And the guy she's currently sleeping with isn't her husband. Mm. But she also hates being alone. Mm -hmm. So whatever she is finding in someone's arms is better than arms being empty. Mm. And that's where the scripture has her meeting Jesus. Mm -hmm. And they talk religion, you know, oh, we have a temple. I know Mm -hmm. you guys have Mm -hmm. a temple. Mm -hmm. One day the Messiah will come. Mm -hmm. But for her to find freedom, he has to go there. Mm-hmm. And he goes, why don't you get your husband mm-hmm. and we'll talk. Mm-hmm. She goes, oh, sir, I'm not married. He goes, no, but I know about the five you've had. Mm-hmm. And I know about the guy you're currently sleeping with. Mm-hmm. It's like, why do you have to pull that out? Mm-hmm. And he goes, because she's going to have a great conversation with Jesus at the well. Mm-hmm. She's going to feel good about, oh, I met the Messiah. I got religion. Mm-hmm. And she's going to walk back and be faced with the truth about who she is. Mm-hmm. And that guilt and shame is going to wreck your best yeah. Jesus moment. Yeah. He does it with Peter. Last time he walks with Peter, Peter's the guy that denies him three times while Jesus is getting the snot beat out of him, mm-hmm. you know, in the fake trial. And Peter knows that. Peter will never give a message for the rest of his life without wondering, is somebody in the crowd knows what I did that night? Mm-hmm. Is somebody here that saw or heard my words? Mm-hmm. And so before Jesus leaves the earth, he has to clear it up with Peter. Do mm-hmm. you love me? Do you love me? I know what you did. I know what you did. I know what you did. Mm-hmm. I had forgiveness. I never applied it to my guilt and shame. Mm. And so what I walk through with people is, what is it that if everybody in the room found out about you, mm-hmm. you would leave the room and not come mm. back? That is what you don't have freedom over. Mm. What is it that if we put it on a screen right now, you would make sure you never showed your face in this group or in this church again? Mm-hmm. You don't have freedom if there's something there. Mm. You should be able to watch it and go, guys, I'm embarrassed, but man, that is why I have grace and mercy. Yeah. Let me tell you about a God that even saved that moment that night in my life. Mm. If you can't say that, you don't have freedom from it. So how do you do it? How do I meet Jesus at the well? How do I take a walk with him on the beach like Peter? I've got to bring my past and say, God, thank you. Mm. Not that I did it, not that it happened, not that I hurt people, but thank you that in spite of this, Mm -hmm. I'm called your son. In spite of this, you not only love me, you really, really like me. Mm -hmm. And this is what the cross was about. God, thank you. Mm -hmm. And so you got to take the skeletons out of your closet and open it and say, God, this I need freedom from. Not forgiveness. Mm -hmm. I'm never going to ask forgiveness for those things again. Mm -hmm. I'll ask forgiveness for what I've done this week, Mm -hmm. but not those things. Mm -hmm. God, thank you that in spite of that, you love me. This is how you see me. And this is what you want from me. Mm -hmm. 
Because I don't know how it works, Ruslan. I yeah. don't know. Is this is this the demon? Is this a spirit? Yeah. Is this my sin nature? Is yeah. this my flesh? Yeah. Is this the broken world? All I know is I have voices in my head that remind me this is who you are. Mm. And because it's true, I can't deny it. Right, right. You know? Right, that's good. You go into church and it's like, Chris, remember the time you got those two prostitutes and you got that bag of cocaine? And I'm like, oh, I'm so embarrassed. I'm like, wait a second. I've never been with a prostitute at Uncle Kane. And Satan's like, oh, I almost got you. It's like, no, that's stupid. You know why Satan doesn't have to lie about me? Because I armed him with enough truth in yeah. my life. Yeah, he don't good. have to make up stories. That's good. And I have to take that same truth and now sit at the well or yeah. take the walk on the beach with Peter and say, God, thank you. Yeah. He wants to come and say, tell me about the five. Mm -hmm. Peter, tell me about the three. Mm -hmm. And I want you to know that I know and we're good. Mm -hmm. So if anyone ever comes out of the crowd, the irony now is me coming back and working here in North County, 15 minutes from Fallbrook. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Where so much of my darkness in my life and my selfishness happened. And and being able to have people come up and go, especially my first five, six years here or so, are you the same Chris Brown? <laughs> and I'm like, oh yeah. I go, hey, hey, before you leave, whatever stories you know, I'll multiply it by 10. Yeah. And let me tell you about the God I met that come has on. me doing this today. Yeah. But I'm not gonna be afraid of the story. That's good. That's good. So you go from LA, and then how did? And then when did you end up back here in North County? Yeah, so I'm in LA doing uh, like seven and a half, eight years of youth ministry mm -hmm. in in the inner city in Pomona, mm -hmm. loving inner city kids, man. Just that's my heart. Mm -hmm. I never want to become one of those real pastors. I just want to be a youth pastor. That's mm -hmm. the front lines of ministry. Mm -hmm. I want to work with high schoolers my entire life. Mm -hmm. uh, Azusa Pacific University, big Christian college up in that area, mm -hmm. gives me a call. That's where I met my wife. There was somewhere in this train wreck um that god was salvaging came this idea of you may want to start knowing something about the bible okay um, <laughs> it was drilled into me my whole life so i had stories preached to me but i don't know and yet what kind of christian college can hold a dude like this yeah. and what type of christian college can i go to because yeah. i'm full of nothing but skepticism cynicism and hypocrisy yeah. of christianity and i find apu and it fits a guy like me yeah um and so I go there, 23 year old, I become a freshman, 23 year old freshman. <laughs> uh, I fall in love with this Jewish girl named Amy. She's perpetually tan, almond eyes, dark hair. Oh my gosh, she's gorgeous. I'm a 23 year old freshman. She's a 21 year old senior. All of her friends try to talk <laughs> her out of it. We've been together now 28 years. Wow. And, uh, um, and in that then, this church in, uh, in Pomona finds me and says, right. hey, while you're doing this, we can't afford a real pastor. We can yeah. only afford, you know, like a part-time guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they heard something I did at a camp. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, I love I love students. So yeah. I was taking whatever I learned in the class, I was yeah. pouring into students. Wow. And then after seven and a half, almost eight years there, that same university mm -hmm. said, would you be a campus pastor for the university? At APU? Yeah, at APU. Oh, wow, okay. And I'm like, no. I said no seven <laughs> times. <laughs> Ruslan, there's no one that's ever heard me speak and walked away and said, oh, that guy's a scholar. Like it's, <laughs> they're like, oh, that guy's an idiot, or that guy needs the grace of Jesus, or hey, he's kind of funny. Yeah. But no one's ever said that dude's a scholar. And I just, I said, no, I don't yeah. work on an academic. And yet God was already at work for me doing chapels and doing stuff on that campus. And my wife and I, for the first time, realized it's not what we want to do. But if we say no to this, we're saying no to the hand of God. It was so <sighs> clear. So we said yes to it. Spent several years as the campus pastor. And then... Came down here, been down at North Coast now, it'll 18 and a half, almost 19 years. Okay. And what was your first position at North Coast? Senior pastor, but don't get too carried away. They give that title away like chiclets. It's, you know, there's like five <laughs> of us. And it was at that time, there was a totem pole of senior pastors, a very clear hierarchy. There's a one, two, three, four. I was the guy buried in the ground with just like my eyes showing. Okay. And uh, I think the only reason at that time, um, they knew there were some other positions, senior pastor positions looking at me, and they're like, if we don't give this idiot a title, I don't even think he'd look at us. <laughs> um, but I love, the problem with me going to the university is I still love student ministry. I consider uh -huh. them students. Uh -huh. And and you give me 4,000 students who live in one place, yeah. and I just, the 70-hour weeks turn into 80-hour weeks. 80-hour yeah. weeks could drift into 90 because it's where you work, slept, played. Yeah. And we did three years of that. I had a little girl, and then my second girl came along. Yeah. And the system was broken. Mm. And for the sake of being the type of dad I always wanted to be, I left one of the coolest jobs in the world. And I said, guys, I can't. I can't do this type of hours yeah. um, and be the dad I want to be. Talking about student ministry specifically. Yeah, college life. College on, life. You know, you're a campus pastor on a 
Christian university. Uh -huh. So your kids don't go home. Mm -hmm. You know, the kids don't show up Sunday at church and Wednesday night. Mm -hmm. They live there. Mm -hmm. So I was spending every night on campus, every activity I'm going to, every mm -hmm. baseball game, softball, football game, mm -hmm. you know, every soccer match, every art exposition, every drama. Yeah. I'm hanging out in the living areas. The kids loved having a youth pastor for their mm -hmm. pastor. Mm -hmm. You know, they the guy before me was a chaplain, good guy, but he's like a 70-year-old chaplain who mm -hmm. just made sure you missed too many chapels this semester. Mm -hmm. And now they got this Yahoo who just wants to hang out and and impart grace and mercy to kids. That's so who need cool. It. And but, so you so so you just kind of like, man, this I I can't keep going at this. Yeah, rate. we didn't burn out our marriage or our life, but we were about four exits away from mm, it. Okay. And I never wanted to have one of the other reasons I didn't ever want to go into church work is because it was impossible to have a good marriage and a healthy family and be a pastor. Mm. Every pastor I knew had a jacked up marriage. Wow. And their kids hated them. That's heavy. Every pastor? Every pastor I huh. knew. I did not, until I met Jim Trail, mm -hmm. you know, in Fallbrook, I never had a relationship with a pastor that's family was healthy. Mm -hmm. Never, never saw it. And so I thought, yeah, because you have to live a life where you're a hypocrite. So, of course, it's not going to work. Yeah. And your family sees who dad pretends to be, and then they see who you really mm -hmm. are. So, of course, the kids are like, Psh, I ain't buying this. Yeah. yeah. And now, since then, I realize I just, I was in some real bad churches. Yeah. But, yeah. And, and that was my thing is I don't want to. As much as I love that job, I always said I was like a I was like a crack addict that got a job working in a meth lab. Like, that's not a good combination. <laughs> you got a guy that loves student ministry and you put him on a university campus. Yeah. And I just I didn't have a no button. Yeah. Um, and that second kid came. That's why we named her Grace. Yeah. Yeah. God's grace was the turning point in my life, and by God's grace, I need to get out and be a better dad. Yeah. So came down to North Coast, been there ever since, and yeah, yeah. Larry Osborne still there on staff with us today, but yeah. been an amazing run. Yeah, yeah. So I got hip to you guys through the J initially. Yeah, um, our young adult group. Yeah, this is 2004, 2005. I don't even know if wow. it was called the Jordan then. It was called something. Yeah. Um, but I would I would, I would, would pop in maybe a couple times a year. Um, you guys did really, uh, you know, the, the stuff for young adults was great. It was yeah. really awesome. And um, I remember hearing this stat that, that blew my mind where back then or at some point in time it sounded like you guys had more and correct me if i'm wrong on the stat but it sounded like you guys had more people or the same amount of people that were attending on a sunday morning the same amount or almost the same amount in midweek small group bible stuff oh yeah yeah i had nothing to do with that <laughs> i you know i was adopted into this church and uh -huh. it was going long before yeah. me on that but that is they've had a uh, kind of a threshold of we will never drop below 80 percent of our weekend okay. attendance in a small group if we ever drop below 80 percent we're going to shut down all the welcome booths all the greeters tables let's make this unwelcoming until we get everyone into a small group and then we can open the front doors again so they're serious about it wow um and it's been that way now for over 30 years uh -huh. So the last 19, it's an amazing family I've been adopted into. I get the benefits of it, and now I'm the biggest cheerleader of yeah. making sure, guys, we're all about being in a small group. Yeah. And you guys also coined the multi-site model, or at least your credit. Video venues. The video venues. Yeah. yeah. Now, is it video venues? I guess it kind of, video venues kind of became multi-site yep. eventually, right? Yeah. Uh, you, uh, uh, There's uh, another guy named Jim Tom Berlin out there that may have done something at the same time, but yeah. either way, it, yeah. they're both done simultaneous. But North Coast was the first to have video venues yeah. as far as you'd walk into a church and instead of having one worship center to go to, there's three or four mm -hmm. different ambiance, different style of music. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we don't aim for an age, we aim for a heart and a mindset. Mm -hmm. So traditions is going to be hymns and a little bit more liturgical mm -hmm. but that's not just for your seniors mm -hmm. that's for post-catholic that's for mm -hmm. people that come east coast more mm -hmm. liturgical mm -hmm. our edge venue is loud subwoofers mm -hmm. it's just it's like a raucous concert with mm -hmm. a good message but that's not just for you know 18 to 25 year olds mm -hmm. In fact, our second largest demographic and there's dudes like me 45 mm -hmm. to 55 that just love rock mm -hmm. you know and so yeah, so you can go and just this one size fits all doesn't work well for church. Mm -hmm. Or we try to blend a service, which means no one's happy. Mm -hmm. And so we try to make one church, many locations. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of critics to it. Like, well, you're just making it easy for people to come to church. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, yeah. Like, you're making it hard for people to come to church? I don't understand. <laughs> At this consumer Christianity, I've never understood that. It's yeah. like, yeah, people need to buy into what they yeah. want. and. Why are we putting roadblocks up? So yeah, yeah. And which I, is funny too. I'm here because I'm I'm I've been very anti mega church my whole life. Even now, that is interesting. Like when you talk, he's one of the largest mega. Church. I'm like, don't say I'm a mega church. <laughs> I don't want to be a mega. But church. But you guys now. are a mega church. We are. But 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 I, and to be very specific, I've always pointed and out how like I think this is a model that's working. Yeah. Right. Because 
it's one thing to have multi-site and it's one thing to go super duper wide, but if there's no connection and no discipleship happening, yeah. then it just becomes a show kind of based yeah. on your preferences and a big old screen and a projector. But with North Coast, it's always oh. been... And the megalomaniac this. of the guy that needs to be on a screen right. and all these locations, and right. why don't you let other people lead? And now it's about just paid professionals. Right. And I'm like, oh, you don't, you don't understand. Yeah. Like the volunteer mass that it takes to pull off North Coast. Yeah. Um, we need 10 times the volunteers from any other church. We have over 3,200 people volunteering. Wow. Um, 3,200. That's a lot. Because if you have a worship center, all uh, you need is a paid band and a paid speaker, right. you know, some paid people. Right. Everyone's in there. Right. We've got 56, at least post pre pandemic. I haven't counted recently, but we had 56 services a weekend, options that you can go to hmm. with all of our campuses and venues. You know how many volunteers you need to make That's sure that people are prayer teams, yeah. greeting teams, yeah. loving people. Worship. We need 24 worship bands a weekend. Yeah. 24. Yeah. Yeah. And how many people attend on a Sunday? Is it north of, uh, what would you yeah. ballpark it? Well, we're trying, like, every church to figure out what that number is now. Like, mm -hmm. we went into the pandemic around 13,000 people in 12.5 and 13.5. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to have about 8,500 and 9,000 in attendance, okay. but our online audience mm -hmm. that's still here mm -hmm. watching is still huge. Mm. And they're still giving, and they're still volunteering, and they're still in small groups. Mm. So you talk about percentage. Mm -hmm. Right now, and I just got out of a meeting this morning, so I have this, we're at 119% of our weekend attendances in the small group. Really? Which you go, you can't do that. Because of online. But we don't know. Because of all wow. of our online people in North County yeah. that are still, and they found, like you and I found, whether it was movies, groceries, whatever, mm -hmm. over the last three years, it's easier to stay at home. Mm. We went and saw Avatar because my mom sent us money and said, you got to take the kids. This is my Christmas present. Mm -hmm. That's the first time we've been in a theater mm -hmm. since all that pandemic. Yeah. Why? Because yeah. I've learned that just buying it at home, we all got a big screen nowadays, yep. and I can pause it to go to the bathroom. We yeah. can go get drinks. We can get <laughs> new popcorn. I don't have to be there on time. Yeah. I don't have to worry about the person in front of me. Yeah, I don't yeah. have to the armrest situation. Yep. Yep. And I've learned, like everyone else, it's just more convenient to do it at home. Yeah. And for good or bad, I think so many in the American church in the last few years realized – it's more convenient to mm. watch this at home. Mm -hmm. But if they're still giving and if they're still in small groups, so mm -hmm. God has their heart because he mm -hmm. has their pocketbook. Mm -hmm. God has their time because mm -hmm. they're meeting with others. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe I'm not going to complain about yeah. it. Yeah. But now the trick is trying to figure out, well, how do you count? Yeah, no, that's that's, that's a good point. And I think sometimes the, the, the critique is obviously like, well, a church that big, how can people be connected? I think you guys kind of take that and flipped it on its head. And then two, it's like, the church that big, how can people be discipled? I hear... Yeah. Usually I hear people who are serious about the Bible, who are serious about their commitment to Jesus in terms of the culture that's created around North Coast. Meaning I don't find a bunch of like casual Christians that oh, yeah. kind of loosely attend. Like ten people who go to North Coast in this area at least tend to take we their faith. I'm sure you do, but we got the whole spectrum. You, we got the hell of a talk guy that comes up and goes, dude, that was a hell of a Christmas message. And I'm like, I think you're new. And we don't use that language around here much. I'm like, we all do during the week, but you don't do it at church. You, call you, gotta, it, you, you don't even the, know the rules. The, the hell of a talk guy? Yeah, we call him hell of a talk um, guy. I got to use that. Someday. We use that all the time. Someone else comes up, like in our meeting, someone goes, man, I met a hell of a talk guy this week. Let me tell you about this story. This yeah. is the most amazing story. Yeah. So we just label them that because yeah. they usually come up and say something like that. And you go, hmm, yeah. you're probably new to the game. And I love that they're there. Yeah. And then we have every spectrum. But yeah, we do. Your small groups are sermon-based, so yep. you have to take notes on the message because you're graded on it that week. You mm -hmm. have to have something to share. Mm -hmm. The beauty of that as a communicator, you put so much time and work into your message. Every time I make a point, mm -hmm. I lose eye contact with everyone in the room because everyone's head goes down and they fill in their outline. Mm -hmm. So when you were in school, when I was in school, all a professor had to say to make me take notes was, by the way, this will be on the test. Mm -hmm. And as soon as he said this is on the test, no matter what, I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm writing that yeah, down. Yeah, yeah. I'm at least getting that one yep, right. Yep. And when all of your small groups yeah. are based on the sermon yeah. and your note sheet is what you're bringing to your small group, yeah. you got to have the blanks filled in. So as a communicator, I love giving a fill in the blank or yeah. a point yeah. and just every head goes down, which now I'll speak somewhere else and I'll give a point and everyone's just staring at you. And I'm like, mm -hmm. you're not writing that <laughs> Take down. Take notes, people. I, I worked hard on that. Yeah. Yeah. And so you you make a discipleship yeah. um, uh, ethos and culture by when you come and visit and you realize when the points come on the screen, everyone starts writing. Yep. You're like, well, I don't want to be the only one not writing. Right. It's yeah. only one blank. Yeah. I'll fill it in. Yeah. yeah. You know? And yeah, it's, so it's you, culture. You it becomes culture. culture. Yeah. Yeah. That's so good. Um, so what would you say to the to the crit to the criticism of like too big, too multi-site, too many screens? 
Uh, why agree. why are there not more people? I don't know how many people, how many local pastors preach versus how much a screen is preaching. Yeah. Um. How how how, how often is that? Like, is it, I'm guessing a couple of times, a, um, once a month, once every eight weeks, someone. Yeah, we have a team guy. of teachers. We're reloading right now, so we got five main voices going on this next year that'll uh-huh. be teaching into it. Uh-huh. I love communicating. Yeah. And even with that, I think I'll teach. I think I ended last year at 28 weekends. Okay. So as much as I love communicating, yeah. knowing what's best for the people and best for the church isn't my voice. Yeah. I still 28, and it's hard to find a pastor of a church of 50 or 100 yeah. that does just 28 weeks. That's great. No, 28 is great. And so that's, we that's try a to use number. multiple voices. Yeah. yeah, that's a low number. And then and then it is that thing of going, well, it's too big. But yeah. my pushback is, here's what, how did you, I ask, well, how did you get big? Mm-hmm. Is it, we have another concert, we have another big event, mm-hmm. we have another bring a friend. Like, we don't do any concerts, we don't do any attractional ministry, mm-hmm. our, our holidays are dismal, mm-hmm. like we don't do big Easter, big Christmas, anything like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and we got big by people bringing friends to go, hey, here's what's helped my marriage. Mm. Hey, here's what's helped me sleep at night. Why don't yeah. you just come with me? Yeah. So then I go, at what point do you tell them, I'm sorry, our membership is full? Mm. That's good. That's good. And now the criticism of the different sizes, if we built an auditorium of 3,000 seats mm-hmm. and we had three services, that's what we need to service, you know, our adults sure. and then all the kids and youth ministries would fill in the rest of the numbers. Sure. If we had three services and an auditorium of 3,000, those critics would probably be okay. Yeah. The fact that we broke it down where people can be known yeah. now becomes, well, why do you need eight campuses and smaller? I'm like, we make campuses because people were driving to us yeah. from outside of 30 minutes. And yeah. when you drive for more than 30 minutes, yeah. You don't have any midweek involvement. Mm-hmm. You're probably not going to get plugged in a small group because small groups are the biggest thing for us. That mm-hmm. is the church. Mm-hmm. We want you to be in a community where you can build that. Mm-hmm. And your kids aren't going to get involved. Because mm-hmm. what do you? And you got two kids. Yeah. You know, you're going to drive a midweek, yeah. a half hour. Yeah. And what is, what's your choice? To sit there for an hour and a half right. or two hours and right. go, or to make another half hour back and right. a round trip. Right. So your kids don't get plugged in. Yeah. You don't get plugged into yeah. a group. So we take the franchise to where they are. Yeah. So you guys just kind of looked at the demographics and said, we got folks in Escondido. We're going to plant a campus in yep. Escondido. It makes sense not to make them drive We look far. at where they're already coming, not mm-hmm. where we want to go. Mm-hmm. Like right now, we've got over 400 people from Temecula that have been coming for years. They're mm-hmm. already in groups. They're already invested. And they're like, when do we keep a, get a campus? They've been asking for five years. Really? And over 400. So wow. we, did a, we did an Easter outdoor service. We used an amphitheater. Mm-hmm. And I think they had a, a Christmas worship night or something mm-hmm. like that. Mm-hmm. And yeah, over 400 people showed up. Mm-hmm. They're volunteers. So when we did a little Who Are You, they're volunteering in our children's ministry, our youth ministry, technically, mm-hmm. already at other campuses. Mm-hmm. And their thing is, well, you can save on gas money. Mm-hmm. Like we're driving down to Fallbrook or San Marcos. Mm-hmm. But their big thing is, we can't bring friends mm-hmm. and our kids aren't bringing anyone to youth group. Because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. you're not going to invite a friend because yeah. it's like, where is it? Dude, yeah. I ain't driving to San Marcos yeah. from Temecula. Yep. So, and then people go, well, why aren't you planning churches? Yeah. And I go, a couple things. One, we do plant churches. Yeah, we yeah. planted three. But on this, I go, they're driving by 15 church plants. Yeah. It's not that there's not churches there. Yeah. They've found a brand that goes for me and my family. My life changed. My disciples, this is what I want. Yeah. So we yeah. take it to them. And Yeah, and I, and I would say one of the things that I found um, the most, I would say, refreshing and encouraging about you guys is kind of watching Pastor Jeff go out and plant Rhythm Church oh, and knowing how awesome. supportive you guys were of that, you know, and how how much you guys were behind him and just the 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 honor and the, and, and the grace that, that was extended to him as, you know, he did an amazing job with that young adults ministry growing yeah. it to 800 or yeah. whatever that number was at its peak. Um, and then you guys didn't, oh, well, you got to stay here. Why don't you go plant your campus? He yeah. went out and did his own thing. And you guys were behind that. That was really cool. So you guys planted And we didn't three. even put our name on it. Yep. We didn't say, hey, uh, it's got to be North Coast or mm-hmm. we'll support you only if. Mm-hmm. We said, Jeff, go with whoever you want to go with. Mm-hmm. So yeah, for context, for those that are listening, he was our young adult pastor. So he was running that Jordan ministry mm-hmm. at the time. So we had hundreds of young adults showing up. He feels a call to be a senior pastor. He's on our teaching team, but on our teaching team, you're only going to get a handful of times a year. Sure. And that guy wants to, most guys lead by communicating. Mm-hmm. And, and I would say I do too. Mm-hmm. But that's a price you pay when you're part of a team. Mm-hmm. You're not going to get the ball all the time. That's fine. Maybe that's actually healthy mm. for the ego and the church. Mm. Um, and so Jeff was a guy. It wasn't about an ego, but there just wasn't enough room. He was called to be a leader mm-hmm. of a church. And here it's like there's no real a leader. Mm-hmm. There's a bunch. Mm-hmm. And Jeff, he had enough differences to go, I just want to do a little different. We're mm-hmm. like, he, he was interviewing all over. Mm-hmm. We're sitting in my backyard under my palapa one night. And the thought came up. Well, Jeff, why don't you do it right here? Mm. His kids were teenagers. He didn't want to leave the house. Mm-hmm. He didn't want to leave his kids' school during that time, mm-hmm. pull him out of school. And he loved surf. Mm-hmm. And he was called to a Southern California lifestyle. And I'm like, well, why don't you start it? Mm. 
Mm-hmm. And why can't we put our arm around you and stand up in front of the church and say, you guys know Jeff. Mm-hmm. He's been here for about a decade at a time. He's been part of our teaching team. Mm-hmm. If you want to be part of what he's doing, go with him. And mm-hmm. even if you just go, ah, I don't think I want to make a choice to leave forever. Mm-hmm. But if you can just give him your attendance and your money for a year mm-hmm. to get the church going, be a Lewis and Clark with this guy. Mm-hmm. And from the front, we just put our arm around him. Mm-hmm. It's not our name. It's not our church. We yep. have no leadership in it. It's yeah. Jeff's. Yeah. But go. And yeah, he started with about 300 people. And from there, the guy's just taken off. Yeah. Yeah. That was dope, man. And you said you guys did that for two other churches as well. Yeah. We did that early on in my place. Steve Redden did the same thing. Uh-huh. We did that up in Temecula uh-huh. saying, man, go up and do that. Yeah. Um, we've got uh, another guy, a little bit different, but we had a guy in our church and our leadership that did that up in Orange County uh-huh. and Kyle Bonneberger and just yeah. said, what do you need from us? Yeah. Now you went further outside our scope where we don't have the people to send you, mm-hmm. but we're going to do it with dude, our blessing, our support, mm-hmm. like what can, you know, and he's still part of our groups, training groups, pastor mm-hmm. groups and mm-hmm. just go, Kyle, go kill it. Yeah. So, yeah. so we'll do venues that people are like, look, you can plant a church in my area. There's 30 in my area. Yeah. I want, it's like in an out burger. Sure. You know, it's like, well, why did you start an In-N-Out Burger in Temecula? Well, there wasn't one. Yeah. yeah. Well, tell people just to go to McDonald's. Tell them to go to Burger King. Yeah. Tell them to go to Wendy's. Yeah. Well, obviously, they like In-N-Out. So, <laughs> so just say, no, we can't bring church to you. Yeah. Or go drive, and your kids aren't going to be involved, mm-hmm. and you're not going to bring friends because it's too far. Mm-hmm. Or we'll bring church to you. Mm. So That's awesome. I, I hope this conversation is... Um, is changing people's perception on mega churches because sometimes it's a negative perception. Sometimes they are too big. Sometimes there isn't accountability. There isn't co leadership. Right? I think North Coast. I'm I'm more intrigued. Is this selection biased? And uh, is North Coast? What, what do you ex- mean by that selection? Like bias? like like is North Coast the exception to the rule, mm. or is North Coast reflective of how most? Mega churches do it. That's the because I just had Pastor Daniel Golding here. Uh, oh yeah, uh, yeah. So he's he up at, uh, at uh, Rock Church uh, in Arizona. Yeah, Rock Point, Gilbert, in Arizona, Gilbert, Arizona. Yeah. yeah. So we just had him, and so I think sometimes we 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 fall into this like tall poppy fallacy uh, syndrome where like the it's something's big, God can't be in it. Yeah. Right. And yeah. that's like such hogwash. Um. And so like that, that, that the reason why I'm, I'm we're talking about these things is because I want people yeah. to know that like there is accountability. There's multi leadership. There's that it's not just a well we're just gonna build our our brand that yeah. hey well, if people like it and they're driving why not just help them not have to drive as far sure. there's, a, there's a tactical practical side to what you guys are doing and but on the other working. side it is true i think the mega church has earned a lot of the negativity to go it's two reasons one what happens with the pride and ego of being on a stage or on a screen in front of that many people mm-hmm. is so detrimental hmm. It is crazy. Mm -hmm. And that's why I don't like the title put on me. Mm -hmm. Um, I shirk away from it all I can to go on Mega Church. Our largest auditorium is packed out about 750. It Mm -hmm. can go to 800. But, Mm -hmm. you know, we we built our new site 10 years ago. We built our largest auditorium of about 750, 800. Mm -hmm. And at that time, we were a church of Mm 7,000. And people were like, that's your new church you're building? And I'm like, we're making sure it's not going to feel big. Mm -hmm. We want people to go into areas where they're known and they can get involved and volunteer Mm -hmm. and set up a big auditorium. Um, but I'll tell you, even the numbers of the church to talk about it, mm-hmm. to come to an interview with someone like you and to do a podcast, all that just drives the ego and the pride. Mm-hmm. And if you don't have a great concept of your rearview mirror mm-hmm. and who you really are and what your butt was saved from, mm-hmm. I think the problem of mega churches and the bad rap it gets is a lot of guys start thinking that's who I am. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, that's not who you are. That's the top 2% of you. Mm. Like who I'm in the weekends teaching, that is the best of Chris and the best <laughs> of my clothes with the best of my hair. That's the best I can look. Sorry about it. With the message I've worked on, hopefully in my giftedness being used by the giver. Yeah. That's the top 2% of yeah. Chris. That ain't me. Yeah. And and what is there that's awesome is a gift. Yeah. And when we spend time on that stage, we start thinking, oh, I'm that guy. Mm. I deserve special treatment. Yeah. You should stand up when I walk in the yeah. room. Yeah. And I am something. Yeah. And it's contrary to everything that we're supposed to be teaching. Yeah. And and so you compound that with the media doesn't get a lot of traction from pointing out a small church that had failures. Mm. Is a church of 45 people, mm-hmm. you know, in middle Texas, mm-hmm. and the pastor said this from it's like, who cares? Mm-hmm. Church saying, oh, but to point out something with another mega church, mm-hmm. that's newsworthy. Mm-hmm. So we've got a condition of size that mm-hmm. preys on the ego and pride mm-hmm. of the people leading it. And we've got a culture that says, ooh, that's newsworthy and we can exploit. And so, yeah, it's generated. And I'm not saying it's false, mm-hmm. but 
you get a lot of negativity about mega church. That's just true. Yeah. Let me, I guess, push back in a, a, a bit, and you tell me what you think about this. And this is my assessment. We don't have to name names. Um, <laughs> oh no. I, I, I think this I think is it's time this, to go. This is this is this is my <laughs> opinion. This is my opinion. So I've said this to Daniel. I've said this to, to, to I've said this to mega church, multiple mega church pastors, and so that's why I'm curious what you think about it. Uh, my assessment is a lot of guys that become lead pastors, yeah, who are amazing have a gift of communication are sometimes forced in a role of lead senior pastor Mm -hmm. when they're really communicators oh yeah and had they waited a decade had they had they been in this era that i'm in it would probably be doing something similar to what i'm doing which is podcasting and youtube and live streaming communicating i'll go and speak at a church every now and then i'll go do an event every now and then a conference but it's generally here and it's in a room, yeah. and the the scale, and there's it's the brain isn't freaked out by standing in front of a platform of ten thousand or five thousand people. Yeah. It all, all the chemistry that's happening here, they're just numbers on a screen, and we could have a conversation. So my theory is a lot of the younger guys, not like you, that were in the trenches yep. doing student ministries yeah. and all this stuff, would have maybe have been um, better fitted to go in be content creators or authors or speakers yeah. or something like that instead of planting churches, 10,000 people, 15,000 people, 20,000 yeah. people. And they're... Because the gift draws that number. Because the gift draws that number, yeah. but they don't really even have a heart to shepherd people. They don't really have a heart to to, to pastor people in the little... And one of the things... It, it, and I get I get this from you. I don't... I, maybe this is, this is not accurate, but I definitely get this from Pastor Jeff is that he's one of the few people, and Daniel as well, he's one of the few people who's a great communicator, mm-hmm and a great shepherd. Mm-hmm. Like he'll sit there and like pastor you and give a fire message. Yeah. A lot of guys aren't aren't equipped like that. They're, no. they're good communicators. Nor they want to be equipped like that. No, yeah, no, I've got a green like room that. set up. I've yeah. got three doors between me and the public and no one's getting <laughs> right. in. Right, right. So what do you think of that assessment? Do you think that's a fair assessment that some guys are- I think it's are... fair and not necessarily to bash on them, but just to go, and it's part of the culture that we live in mm-hmm. that we put the teaching gift ahead of any other gift nowadays. Mm. And we also assume that giftedness means spirituality, and mm. nothing could be further from the truth. Mm. Giftedness is just giftedness. Mm-hmm. It has nothing to do with your spirituality. Mm. But we got churches that will hire giftedness regardless of character and spirituality. Mm. You've train wrecked two churches, ah, but you've been on the bench for six months. We'll pick you up, mm. you know, because we need that giftedness because we got to fill seats because mm-hmm. that's what generates income. Mm. And so, yeah, I think exactly what you said is true. We've got character and maybe other leaderships that don't match a teaching gift. Mm-hmm. To which I would say, just be a teaching pastor. Let someone else lead. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The problem with the ego is, if I've got a good teaching gift, Mm -hmm. I'm a great leader. Mm, They're not not the same. I'm a great leader. Yeah, yeah. They're not the same. Yeah. They're not. But because you're good at something or great at something, you think you're great at this and go, no, you're not. And, And mine, yeah, I've been given a great teaching gift. But I would much rather lead a team than teach. Like yeah. if, if our if our elder board um, that I need to report to, that I have covering on, that they can fire me at any time they have a consensus, um, if they came to me and said, hey, here's the state of our church, you can either lead our team mm-hmm. or you can be a teaching pastor, but you can't do both. Mm. Um, go home, talk to your wife, pray about it. Mm. I'd say, I don't, I don't need to. I want to lead the team. Mm. Wow. I'd much rather build healthy teams and lead a team wow. than my teaching gift. Yeah. And part of that is though at this year in my ripe old age of having decades of using the teaching yeah. gift and go, it's been great, yeah. it's fun, but then I'll use that gift to teach staff. I'll yeah. use that gift. To, I'm much more about how do you build the locker room and the team yeah. than, than what are you doing on the weekend and that. Would you say it's because you're more shepherding in that way? Like you're, you're more pastoral and you want to pour into people? Yeah, I just, I think part of it is knowing my upbringing in several things. Yeah. My only affirmation and joy that I found about myself, yeah. my only sense of getting away from some of my insecurities came in a locker room. Hmm. You know, what I could do with that group and what we did on the field on Friday nights was just like, okay, that's where I found my only value that I felt like I have worth. Hmm. Um, and the moment I was out of that locker room and on the field, I don't have worth. Hmm. Um, so I think that has something to do with it. And then I think the churches that I saw growing up and just being set on, there's a different way to do it. Hmm. And so, you know, I brought Damien with us, our young adult pastor. Shout out, out to Damien. Shout out to Damien Easter, man. Talking about a guy who can teach. Yeah. Not sure about his spirituality, but he can <laughs> teach. Um, and, uh, and, and he'd give credit to that too and just go, yeah, Chris is about building that healthy mm-hmm. team. And just going, if I have to spend more of my waking hours mm-hmm. with the people I work with mm-hmm. than with my own wife and three kids, mm-hmm. I better really love the people I work with. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, it's not worth it. Mm-hmm. Um, 
Is and that so, caught or is that taught? Did you did you catch that from being around Pastor Larry and 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 he's kind of you know yeah. a bit more seasoned, uh, different teaching gift? No, than yours? that was unique. I mean, I've learned so much from Larry. The team stuff for me was just I've always been a relational guy. Yeah. I've always been that flaming extrovert, relational guy. I've made locker rooms better my whole life. Mm-hmm. I've made, you know, my work crews better my whole life. Mm-hmm. I was better in the office, you mm-hmm. know, and people noticed when I was going, hey, you were out of the office, you know, this week. Man, mm-hmm. we felt the difference. And I was like, huh, I make circles better. And mm-hmm. so that was something that was unique. And then you go, well, maybe that's a gift. Mm-hmm. And maybe that's, I'm wired that way. Mm-hmm. Now, how do I, you know, parlay that into churches when so many churches have unhealthy staff mm. because they're led by people who are about their giftedness mm-hmm. and not about discipling people. And and my thing is that, Bruce, yeah. is, your giftedness is not better than any other gift. Yeah, yeah, it's good. It, it gets the popularity. It gets yeah. the standing O's. Yeah. But, man, it's not better than any other gift of mm-hmm. serving or hospitality or administration. Mm-hmm. So why do we treat it better? Mm. Yeah. It just blows me away, this thing about teaching nowadays. Yeah, yeah. Um, that we expect to be treated different. Um, we expect to be different on our team because I'm the one with this gift. And I'm like, everyone gets a gift. Yeah. What makes yours better? Yeah. Well, culture now says that is the gift to have. Yeah. Well, we should have never been playing the culture, but we should be playing the kingdom. Do you think the system is broken? Having said all that, do you think the mega church system is broken? No. Okay. I think there's broken people in the system. Okay. And I think the system allows for teams to be broken. Mm. You know, do I feel like, you know, the NBA is broken? Do I feel like, you know, well, look at this scandal. Look what happened in the NFL. I don't think the system's broken. The system allows for you to be an unhealthy player, and the system allows for you to have an unhealthy team. Mm. But that's not mean the system's broken. You know, the mm. system is the church is the body of Christ. So in one essence, is it broken? Every single one of us. Mm. But it's still the system that's in play. Mm-hmm. Now look around and say, how can this be done differently? Because mm-hmm. the system also allows us to do the stuff like we do. Mm -hmm. The system also allows you to be healthy. In fact, it's built for you to be healthy. But man, you can use really bad people will take a great system and be terrible at it. Mm. A great system with people that are trying are going to make great things. Mm. So the system is not itself. You know, it's it's not the problem of the system. It's the problem of the players and the teams you have in it. Yeah. So it's it's the broken people that taint and corrupt the system. And the problem with this gift is you can't tell someone they're broken if they have the spotlight and the camera on them. Mm. They're untouchable. Mm. That's the part that's broken. Mm. And yet I look at that and go, other systems you're allowed to, other churches you are, you built a place where that guy's off limits. Mm. That gal's off limits. Mm. You can't speak to them like that. Mm. And I'm like, I go around with peers and churches our size and the amount of staff, they're like, oh, I've never met the senior pastor. Mm-hmm. You know, I've never been allowed to speak to him or shake his hand. And I'm hmm. like, what is yeah. going on? Yeah. We've had people come to North Coast from other large churches across the nation and not to mention names, places, but they'll find me. And we don't even have a green room at our church. There's no backstage. Mm-hmm. So you're going to sit in the crowd. You're going to go back to the crowd. You're going to meet everybody yeah. before and after. In between services, I'm out in the plaza just hanging out. Yeah. And I, a few months ago, I had this woman come up. She goes, is something wrong? And I go... Well, what do you mean there's something wrong? She goes, it's you. And I go, oh, and it's you. And she goes, no, you know what I mean. And I go, no, I don't know what I mean. And she goes, what are you doing out here? And I go, this is where I kind of work and live. Yeah, yeah. And she goes, oh, my gosh. And she tells me the church she came from. Yeah. She had been going there for seven years, never once was allowed to see the pastor except for him being on stage. Yeah. He's got his own security and parking, yeah. comes in oh, yeah. and out, his own back thing. And yeah. I was like... What have we done to get to a point of going, that's the shepherd? Mm. The system allows for brokenness because mm. it's made of broken people. Mm. But the system also allows for incredible healing and grace and mercy mm-hmm. for those that want to lean into yeah. it. You see why I asked if North Coast was the exception to the rule and not the rule, though. I get it. Yeah. I get it. I've I've hated green rooms at conferences I go to because I've met <laughs> people. Green rooms and are I'm the like, worst, man. I'm like, dude, I love this guy, but listen to him. And after that 15 minutes, I'm like, I'll never listen to you again. <laughs> I'm, my whole thing is, I want to know your marriage and I want to yeah. know your kids. I'll listen to you. Yeah. If, if I don't know your marriage, I don't know your kids, or I'll listen at a distance and yeah. go, man, I'm not putting stock in a person. Yeah. Um, but man, the guys that I love and know, and I'm like, let me tell you about their marriage and let me tell you about what their kids think of them. Yeah. That's a guy I listen to. That's good. That's a gal I'll follow. What do you make of, having said all of this, yeah. uh, the, the system, uh, you know, green rooms, pastors telling not to make eye contact with them, all kinds of weird stuff that yeah. we hear about, right? What do you think the role of deconstruction and deconversion has played into all of this conversation? Oh, deconstruction is beautiful if 
you can construct something after it and not just walk away and say so it's re broken. reconstruction reconstruction deconstruction is beautiful when there's reconstruction mm -hmm. if it's just for the point of deconstruction where does it leave you mm -hmm. with it left where i was mm -hmm. that's the church it's broken i'm never going to fall for it again even the people running it are hypocrites mm -hmm. look what's happening in the pastor's room look what's happening and i'm like i'm not falling for it again mm -hmm. i got abused at a christian school and that's and and part of that was in my deconstruction of well here's what's wrong here's what and that's where it left you. It leaves you jaded and hardened, and you're the soil that no matter what seed's thrown at you, it just bounces off. Mm -hmm. So that reconstruction is necessary. Mm -hmm. But I think both are necessary, deconstruction. I think we always got to look at ministry and just go, the gospel is this, it's this incredible diamond that's just rolling down a dung hill. I forgot where that illustration <laughs> came from. But every decade or two, man, it just picks up more crap and more crap, and you're yeah. left with this big ball of crap, and you yeah. forget that somewhere inside of this. Yeah is God's plan A, yeah. and there is no plan B. Yeah. So that's when you say, is the system, I'm like, the system is God's only plan. Yeah. The church is the system. Yeah. Now look what's happened to it. We need to deconstruct a lot of that and take a lot of that crap off and come back to what is it supposed to be yeah. and the why behind that. Mm. And then go, man, how do we love people with that grace and mercy instead of raising bars that no one can jump yeah. and putting people in positions that no one should ever be in? Yeah. And so I don't trust someone unless they've deconstructed their faith. Really? I don't trust someone unless they've walked with the limp. All right. Yeah, I I don't trust someone who's never questioned their faith. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is what we're gonna do, guys. We're gonna go to a, uh, an extended version on the Patreon right now uh, to go deeper on this conversation, specifically with deconstruction, because I have I have some more questions. I need some clarity on this. So you said I I made the extended version. You made the extended version. Man. Congratulations. So 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 you said you don't <laughs> trust someone unless. Hey, if you guys want to see the extended version of this interview where we go deeper on the topic of deconstruction and him sharing a story that made me tear up, sign up for our Patreon for only $5 a month. It helps us contextualize the gospel, and in exchange, you get exclusive segments to parts of the podcast that are only on Patreon. A lot of our podcasts come out early on Patreon, exclusive daily after-party streams that are only on Patreon, a discount code for our merch store, and Discord access. So sign up below for only $5 a month, and I'll see you over there, all right? Peace.